Hello guys, Winston here. In my last video, I created what I thought was the greatest coffee scoop in the world, the Cyber Spoon. It was something I created more for fun than anything else, but the idea of selling these did cross my mind, and that created a problem. The Cyber Spoon, despite being inspired by a bulletproof automobile, was machined to be more of an elegant art piece than a tank. If some underpaid courier dropped an Amazon package on top of an unprotected cyberspoon in transit, the cyberspoon would be toast. My solution was to create some custom packaging, but that idea only became possible when Meku reached out to me and offered me use of their form box, a compact desktop vacuum former. Vacuum forming is probably one of the quickest ways to create duplicates of a shape better than anything subtractive or additive. I don't think of a vacuum former itself as a device that makes things, instead it's sort of an object multiplier, but more on that later. For now, we need to create some bucks, the positive shapes over which we can form heated plastic. The first thing we need is a starting block, a foundational volume from which we can create two separate bucks, one that can fit a cyber spoon and one to form a cover or lid. I drew out a rectangle and patterned out some semicircular cutouts around the perimeter. The innermost profile of these intersected elements was extruded upward with a taper angle. That pleated pattern around the perimeter of my buck serves a very important role. It allows for a small degree of expansion and contraction of the skirt of material around the perimeter. If there's any misalignment or missizing of the base and lid portion of this packaging, things won't get impossibly tight or start buckling. On the bottom half of the packaging, I imported my cyberspoon model and I subtracted it from the body. This created the perfect size cutout to hold a spoon, but it neglects a very important factor. There would be a plastic film lining this cavity, so I needed to push out the walls of this cavity by at least the thickness of my plastic. Furthermore, the ball nose end mill I would use to machine this cavity would leave radius corners. That could interfere with the fit of the cyber spoon which has sharp edges on the outside, so I had to push out the walls even further to compensate. There were some fillets in the cyber spoon model that didn't translate well in the negative cavity left by the boolean operation. I couldn't effectively press or pull the faces that I wanted to that touched those fillets, so I just deleted them. Then I made my adjustments to the walls and then re-added those fillets. In case you didn't know, you can select features like fillets and just hit delete to remove them and Fusion will automatically fill them in as best as it can. It's kind of a messy shortcut, and you really shouldn't use it if you can avoid it, but in this case, this was the easiest way to achieve what I wanted. To create my lid, I took my base shape and offset all my faces outward by the thickness of the plastic I would be using, which was half a millimeter, plus a little extra margin. I added a little more material to the top face that I could then pocket away to leave my logo proud on top. Fillets were generously applied over every sharp corner I could find. In terms of cam strategy, this was a pretty simple setup. For each model, I started with a 3D roughing operation, leaving a small onion skin for work holding security. Then, while I still had a quarter inch square end mill in the router, I would also finish all of the flat faces. Next up, I'd swap in an eighth inch ball end mill to hit all the fine details, and conclude with a quarter inch ball end mill that was long enough to finish the walls down to the bottom of the stock. I needed a ball and mill to be able to plunge deeper than the thickness of my stock so that it could touch the sloped walls of my bucks with the side of the cutter. I created a contour toolpath that I would run before everything else to make clearance in my MDF wasteboard so that a quarter inch ball end mill would encounter as little resistance as possible when it would inevitably plunge below the floor of my stock. And that was my cam setup in a nutshell. Let's talk about material next. I would be machining these bucks out of ren shape. Renshape is like the illegitimate stepchild of MDF and machinable wax. It's got a super fine, grainy, porous structure, but it slices absurdly cleanly and easily while holding amazing detail. Renshape is perfect for vacuum forming because that porosity lets a little air seep through it. If you have a concave depression that you can't evacuate the air out of, plastic won't get pulled into those cavities because there's no vacuum that's formed there. Air can be pulled through Renshape at varying rates depending on its density. I'm work holding my wrench shape with double sided tape and using those clearance cuts that I mentioned earlier to inform where I place my tape. This way my end mill will never cut into tape and smear adhesive all over the flutes. Now because wrench shape is so absurdly easy to machine, I got a little overconfident. 
Not in the sense that I pushed my machine to failure, but because I induced some surface finish artifacts into my bucks. The areas that were finished with a ball end mill turned out really great, but the more aggressive accelerations I have set on my CNC meant that the gantry and the router endured a lot of sudden direction changes. With the weight of the HDZ and the router, and the small but not insignificant elasticity of the Delrin V wheels, this translated into spindle nod. When the CNC comes to a stop in certain directions, the XZ carriage wants to swing forward and eventually downward, and even though it's just by a thou or two, that's enough for the end mill to leave swirl marks in the face of my ren shape. Short term, the answer to this would be to drop the accelerations of my CNC and reduce my finishing feed rates. Longer term, the solution is clearly to upgrade to a linear rail-based Shapeoko with a stronger X to Z axis interface, aka the Shapeoko Pro. But I didn't have one of these at the time of this project. But I digress. The machining of the Ren shape was fantastic and stress-free despite the surface finish artifacts I was introducing, which at the time I hadn't realized would be a big deal. Alright, onward to the only open horizontal work surface I have in the shop. Before I talk about the tools though, I want to be transparent about the fact that Meiku provided me a form box, and Home Depot sent me a beast of a vacuum, Rigid's 14 gallon NXT wet dry vacuum. Spoiler alert, I really do like these products, but I'm going to try to be as upfront and honest in discussing the pros and cons of these tools and where I think they excel. First things first, this new toy is the Meiku form box, which was generously sent to me by the Meiku team. It's a vacuum forming machine with a working area of about 200 by 200 millimeters, which is a hair under 8 by 8 inches. I found this thing pleasantly easy to use with extremely simple but clear documentation, which I appreciated, temperature control for the built-in ceramic heater, a timer function, and a reasonably convenient plastic clamping frame that rides on bearings. Now, way back in the day, I did try vacuum forming with a very janky DIY setup, and while you can absolutely achieve success with something like that, I would honestly not want to do it again. In a space-limited shop like mine, having to keep a toaster oven around or some other bulky heat source would be a big pain in the butt. The form box is fantastically compact, but I could see serious users wanting something larger. As is, I found myself redesigning the Cyberspoon to be a little bit shorter to guarantee that my bucks would fit within the work area of the form box with a comfortable margin all around. As a CNC user, I appreciate it when someone spoon feeds me good cutting parameters. MakeU offers two materials that come with some starting recipes. The clear cast sheets they provide is probably PET, and the form sheets feel to me like high impact polystyrene. The included documentation makes vacuum forming as easy as baking a cake, provided you're not in an excessively windy environment. I remember back when I saw the form box at a Maker Fair many years ago, the booth staff were having trouble getting the plastic to heat up outdoors. The outdoor breeze got between the plastic sheets and the ceramic elements, throwing off the heating times. So, pro tip, avoid setting the form box in front of a fan or using it outdoors. Anyhow, once you see the material sagging, you can slam down the frame carrying the plastic, which can automatically power on a vacuum if you optionally run it in series through the form box. On my first attempt, the lid came out great, but the base portion of my packaging came out quite poorly. The plastic had a hard time forming into the Cyberspoon's pocket. I tried this again with the white hips material, thinking it might have been a limitation of the PET and the aspect ratio of the cavity I had. If features are too deep, there's a chance that the material won't be able to stretch enough to match the exposed surface area of a pocket. But after a second lackluster forming attempt, I started wondering if maybe Ren shape wasn't as permeable to air as I thought, because those failures were absolutely not due to a lack of suction. The vacuum I'm using for these experiments is the 14 gallon rigid NXT wet dry vacuum, provided very conveniently I might add by the sponsor of today's video, the Home Depot. Home Depot approached me a little while back with a choice of tools they were looking to promote, and I kid you not, I researched the heck out of my options and specifically picked out this vacuum for one reason. This vacuum sucks, really hard. It sucks 165 CFM to be exact, and because this is the improved NXT line, there's serious vacuum pressure behind that volumetric rating. In terms of quietness, you won't confuse this for a fest tool, but acoustically it's not bad at all, and it's way better than some of the old shop vacs I've used. The harmonics are lower pitched, not shrill, so it's really not offensive to be around. I will also note that I'm using this vacuum with a diffuser, otherwise you would get a concentrated jet of warm air shooting out the back, and hear a bit more of a whooshing sound in the background. For a couple dollars, these are definitely worth it in my opinion. 
Anyhow, suffice to say, my early vacuum forming failures were not for a lack of vacuum power. Based on how slowly I was observing the plastic being pulled into my spoon cavity, I decided that I had to help it along. The bottom of that negative spoon cavity is pretty thin, thin enough for me to punch through with some PCB drills. With that small change, vacuum forming my cyber packaging happened almost instantaneously. Now, for my purposes, the one thing that holds the form box back from being a legitimate tool of mass production is my lack of an easy way to cut out my packaging from larger sheets of plastic. If you're making small casting molds or something, you probably don't need to worry about this. You can keep the form sheets intact or just trim around it however you want. But to vacuum form something that would itself be the final product, you'll need a steady hand to trim up the edges cleanly, or a custom die cutter, but that's a project for future Winston to worry about. In my early packaging prototype, you can see some of the machining marks and the surface finish artifacts I was talking about earlier. Wren shape, however, is really easy to sand, so I was able to improve the lower buck, but because there's a large shallow but recessed pocket on the buck for the lid, this one is better left to be remachined in the future. But in the meantime, I have a new manufacturing technique I can tuck away in my back pocket, and a really good idea on how to apply it to some of my future projects. I want to thank you all very much for watching, make you for sending me their form box, and the Home Depot for hooking me up with a crazy powerful vacuum. Links to all the tools I used will be in the description below. I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.